So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Luna Polinelli and uh, I'm a PhD student in archaeology here at the University of Iceland. Um, I am yeah, still in the early stages of my project since I've just started in, uh, in September. Um, but yeah, so, so far I've been uh, doing a history of research of uh, all the uh, studies and discussion that have been uh, made in this field of uh, Viking Age boat burials. Uh, so my supervisor is Ori Vestensen, that is um, of course a professor of archaeology here at the University of Iceland. So um, first of all, we, when we say boat burials uh, in the Viking Age, I think everyone thinks about something like this and uh, this is what comes up when you google Viking funeral not even mentioning boats um, and uh, this is uh, actually quite far I would say from what the reality was um, not everyone was uh, buried with a boat or cremated on a boat and uh, boat burials could be expressed in many different ways the custom could the custom was not uniform but was expressed in, yeah, in many different ways. It could be uh, inhumation or cremation, uh, inhumation under a mound. So um, this is uh, what everyone thinks of when we say book burials, but it's not really what the reality of it. So the project, uh, my project focuses on offering a new interpretation of the book burial custom. Um, based on what has been done before and uh, said before. And, uh, and the primary objective, I would say, though, it's to uh, compile a comprehensive catalog of book burials. Um, in my thesis, I will focus on two specific regions. I will focus on Iceland and uh, probably just south of Norway, because the amount of book burials ac across the Viking world is massive and it would be too ambitious for a PhD thesis to cover all of them. But uh, I've chosen these two regions because um, I, the pool of both burials in Iceland is quite uh, small and this will allow me to create a relevant uh, framework to then assess also the Norwegian material. And uh, I will conduct several studies on the, on the data of, Iceland, of both Icelandic and Norwegian boat burial to see um, the variation in the custom and uh, the distribution of these graves and so on. Um, so um, the last catalog has been published in uh, 1970 and 1974. And since then uh, there has no, there hasn't been a, a comprehensive catalog uh, really it has not been released um, and as such I think there is a need for an updated list uh, that hopefully will facilitate further further studies in this field. So moving on to the history of research that is what we're going to talk about today we will first look at the written records that are the medieval Icelandic texts, mostly sagas, and then an, an Arabic account um, called uh, Risala or Risala. Um, then we will look at the secondary sources that are the debates and discussion that have been made in the field. Um, so we will first look at how early antiquarians and excavators and, and the scholarship from the early 19th century to modern scholarship. Then uh, we will see how book burials have been identified through time, uh, how they have been interpreted, and we will discuss both symbolism and the origin and end of the custom. So, um, the medieval Icelandic texts, mostly, as I said, are sagas. They describe um, shortly the, the boat burial custom, or better said, they mention the custom. Um, they uh, mention it in different ways. It could be because the custom, as I already said, was not uniform, but there was a 
there was a high degree of variability in the way it was expressed, or it could also be that the authors didn't really know much about this custom, because it is important to keep in mind that the sagas were written down several centuries later, um, after the custom had stopped. Um, so perhaps the authors made some details up uh, in their stories. Uh, whereas uh, Risala by Ahmad Ibn Fadlan is an Arabic source, and this source has been used extensively by scholars. And this is uh, the account from which we take this idea of the Viking ship, the Viking, let's say, funeral burning. Um, it is an eyewitness account uh, from 921. Uh, Ibn Fadlan um, witnessed, uh, witnessed a Rus funeral on the river Volga. And he describes it fairly in detail how it was arranged and performed. He says that it took several days to get this funeral arranged and uh, a boat, big boat was used. Uh, material wealth was placed on the boat. Uh, a lot of animals were sacrificed, horses, dogs, chickens, and, uh, and then also a person was sacrificed, a slave girl, as he describes. Um, and then the, the boat was set on fire and the ashes were transported from the fire location to a secondary location when they were buried. So, as I said, this account has been used extensively, but um, some of its elements are easier to corroborate with actual um, archaeological evidence than others. For example, Yves Fadlan describes that a tent-like structure was built on the deck of the ship. And uh, we know that this actually happened because we see that, for example, the Oseberg ship in Norway has this tent-like structure on its deck. We know that these animals that he describes were actually sacrificed in uh, often in alongside boat burials um, because we have found archaeological evidence of the bones and we have we could verify that the that these animals were killed when they were still healthy and young whereas the problem uh, for other elements like human sacrifices well this element is much harder to verify um, I have to say uh, his account has led a lot of scholars to look at multiple cremations or multiple inhumations and think that for sure one of the occupants was a primary occupant, that is the actual deceased, and the other skeletal remains were secondary occupants, um, that is human sacrifices. Um, especially like in the case of the Osseberg ship burial, we have two um, we find two female skeletal remains, and one has been thought to be yeah, the actual deceased, and the other one was uh, a sacrifice. But who's who has changed through time, according to scholars? And at the end of the day, though, we cannot really verify this, because the bone preservation is so poor that we cannot verify whether one of the skeletons have has died you know, has been killed. Uh, so this account, as I said, has, has led scholars to think this, but really there is no way to verify. So looking at secondary sources, that is what scholars have said. Um, as we have seen, sorry, the, here is a typo. It should be um, Rudbeck 1, uh, 1698. Um, so um, they knew about both burials because they had read about it in the sagas. Um, so when they, early antiquarians, when early antiquarians faced graves that potentially could have contained both burials, they were ready to recognize them as so. Uh, as so. so for example, in Utuna in Sweden, a cremation grave was found with what they call ship nails. And so, 
this led to more and more research in the field. Um, a few boat burials, or let's say alleged boat burials, were found also in Norway. And the first monograph on the subject was published by Verlof in uh, 1827. But the finds contained in this monograph were so few that already, not even 100 years later, it was considered obsolete. So in the course of the 19th century, more and more bur burials came to light. Um, the first overview of the custom was done by Antren. Uh, and then we have a lot of regional um, area specific catalogs, uh, both ju um, just about both burials and also about, let's say catalogs that list all graves in an area and include also both burials, as for example, Christian Eldian's work. But the only uh, scholar who has presented a complete catalogue that considers all both burials across the Viking world is Michael Müller-Wille, who published his monograph in German in 1970. Uh, he uh, looked at previous catalogues, he looked at museum records and archaeological reports to list his catalogue. And uh, in his monograph, he tried to incorporate all the ways in which boat symbolism was expressed. So boat burials, but also boats offered in bogs or stone settings in the shape of a boat, um, and listed all locations, um, as you can see. For example, Norway here has only 231 entries, whereas if we look at the previous slides, Schedelig uh, listed 552 entries. Uh, so why is that? Uh, well, this is because the way in which boat burials were identified changed over time. So when we find a boat burial, we have to consider these are thousand or more year old burials and uh, wood mostly always the case, uh, rots away. So in some cases we've been very lucky that we've found almost complete boats, like in the case of the Oseberg burial or Gokstad. But in other cases we can find the impression on, of the boat on the soil, like in Sutton Hu, or we can find the iron parts like nails, rivets and clench poles that are still in the shape of a ship or boat. But in most cases, except for example, if it's a cremation grave or uh, the grave has been broken into by grave robbers or uh, the grave has been found through an accident like a construction uh, accident, um, then the iron parts might not be in the shape of a boat anymore. So how can we tell if it's a boat or not? Well, first of all, these iron parts, uh, these fasteners, are uh, their number can be extremely variable. And so, of course, scholars were wondering if they could be actually the remains of some other wooden object. So Olaf Rieg uh, in 1877, on the basis of Ifad Land's account, uh, argued that at least in cremation graves, the, the um, discrepancy in the number of uh, iron parts could be due to the fact that some iron parts would be lost or purposely not included in the final burial while transported from the pyre to the secondary location for the burial. But um, Gustafsson, however, argued that any number of uh, iron parts in a grave was evidence for a boat grave, regardless of quantity. And I personally think that this is due to uh, the, sh the shaping of national identity that was going on in uh, Norway, in Sweden in that time. But burials are seen as a strong part of the Nordic heritage and identity. And so there was the, this desire to have more to strengthen this uh, yeah, Nordic identity. Um, but however, in 1956, Christian Eldjern, uh, <laughs> question this theory, um, saying that actually a large number of uh, 
iron parts can be used even building other objects. Oh, and uh, sorry, I want to say Gustafsson theory then explains why we find so many entries in uh, Schedelig's catalog from 1917, but not in Müller-Wille in 1970. Um, because Müller-Wille in his catalog decided to include it as a rule of thumb, only burials that contain at least five iron pieces, although we have certainty that it's, according to him, that it's a boat burial, only if we have 100 parts, iron parts. However, we know that there are some exceptions and that some bo confirmed boats with less than 50 iron pieces have been found. For example, I think in Kalderhofti here in Iceland. Um, but anyway, uh, the thing is that nails, rivets, and clench bolts, that are these three types of fasteners, are actually very different between each other. And especially clench bolts are almost exclusively used in uh, boat construction, which means that if we find clench bolts in a grave, it is very likely that that is a boat. But especially early scholars and excavators were not interested at all in the iron parts. They were, they cared more about treasure and so didn't really record the type or the number of these parts. So moving on to the way this boat, the boat burial custom is interpreted, there are three theories. And I wanna say these three theories do not go against each other but coexist. The first one sees the boat as a statement of power and social standing. The boat is not really important, it's just part of the grave goods, uh, but its presence shows that it is a lavish burial and therefore whoever is buried in there must have been someone very important. Um, and this is supported by the sagas and uh, Ifadlan because it is narrated that always the most important people, like the people that are granted a boat burial are usually very important or influential in the community. To the point that some scholars have also tried to find a historical counterpart using the sagas for the human remains, especially Inglinga saga. The religious theory um, instead says that the boat is used as a means of traveling to the afterlife and was first argued by Oscar Montelius in 1885. And he takes this idea from uh, Hildebrand's theory that uh, boat, um, boat funerals, um, which have this idea of boat, the boat being needed for uh, overworldly travel, is common uh, among primitive cultures who lived in coastal areas. So Montelius saw Nor the Norsemen uh, in pre-Christian times as primitives, uh, they lived in a coastal area, so his theory made sense to him. Um, and this theory is very well regarded today. The performance theory is a more modern approach. Uh, it's, it sees the boat funeral uh, note not as the celebration of one individual, but as the celebration of the entire community. It is a social practice that is meant to create and reinforce collective memories and identities. Um, if you imagine the boat burial, for example, an uh, innovation under a mound must have taken days to complete, to transport the ship to the burial place and then build the mound. It was for sure a collective endeavor and the deceased was not buried, you know, according to his idea or her idea, but it was buried according to the community idea of that person, according to his social persona. So, and um, this theory goes further by saying that uh, perhaps the boat was used as a stage because um, Ganso has conducted some studies on the Alsaberg ship mound, which showed that the mound was built first on a half of the ship and one half was in the open. And so according to Neil Price, some ritual performance might have unfolded on the boat. And then um, the mound was closed months or maybe years after. And a similar interpretation can also be made for other graves. For example, the Scambi boat grave, uh, as uh, Williams, the, 
gave the first talk here, um, argued that the stone ships, so this grave is uh, covered by a stone ship setting and it is a little lower than the surrounding area. So perhaps this also was a limited stage area uh, for meant for a ritual performance. But it is important to keep in mind that this interpretation are based only on study on specific sites rather than on the custom as a whole, because as I said, the custom is extremely variable. So the, the issue is different, the discussion is different for both burials in Great Britain. Um, so um, in Scandinavia, um, there, were, there was never a doubt on who, uh, you know, who the occupants were, where were they from. Whereas in Britain, the, in Great Britain, the discussion is different. So some uh, have, boat burials have been found in, uh, in Scotland and on the Isle of Man. And they have been dated through the coins um, to the Viking Age. So this, um, so scholars have identified the occupants as uh, Norsemen who possibly had died there um, either during conquest wars or as settlers. And it made sense to consider these burial occupants as Norsemen. Whereas the same cannot be said for the burials, the boat burials found in East Anglia, uh, in Snape, Sutton Hu, and Caesaron Sea, uh, which have been dated to the seventh century. In the seventh century, the Norse presence in England was almost non-existent, I'd say, and East Anglia was ruled by an Anglo-Saxon family of the Woofingers. So scholars have drawn a lot of parallels between Sutton Hu especially and other 7th century burials found in Sweden, uh, namely Vandal and Valsgarde. Um, but really the similarities between these, these burials are just the presence of a boat and the presence of weapons and armor. Uh, Sutton Hu is far more uh, lavish than either Vandal or Balsgarde. Um, but still scholars have been trying to interpret it through a possible connection with Sweden. So, uh, so they thought that perhaps the occupant could be a Swede uh, who had died in, uh, in East Anglia and had been buried as it was the custom back home or that, the, that actually these were burial grounds of the kings of East Anglia, and that the Wuffingham dynasty though had some connection to Sweden, uh, especially in light of the poem Beowulf, to the point that um, scholars, uh, Sam Newton has argued that the Wuffingham dynasty actually descended from character in, in Beowulf. Although this seems like a bit of a stretch, <laughs> It is possible uh, that one of that there might have been a Swedish connection um, of these graves. However, Martin Carver, that has um, conducted several uh, surveys and research in in East Anglia, questions this connection with uh, Sweden. According to him, the burials are have nothing to do with Scandinavia, but they are an example of uh, boat symbolism that we, which was common among Germanic people, and uh, it was for him uh, it was a reaction of the Anglo-Saxon against the advancing of Christianity, and they reacted by building this incredible pagan uh, burials, and a similar. Um, theory has been made also by Esle Roestal for Scandinavia. Uh, they see it, the boat burials are as a reaction against the new religion. So um, at first, um, boat, the boat burial custom was considered a northern, northern custom that originated just a few centuries before the Viking Age, and so was probably Norse. But this was more, again, to strengthen the national Nordic identity 
uh, when actually uh, later studies have shown that the first clinker built boats uh, in burials are found from with certainty from the sixth century onwards, um, not just in Scandinavia, but they appear in different in different areas. Um, but certainly the boat was important as a symbol through from the Bronze Age, even further before. Uh, we see this in the ship rock carvings in Bohuslän in Sweden, or uh, the rock carvings in Gotland. Um, we see boats offered in bogs, uh, for example, in Denmark, or uh, stone settings in the shape of a boat. Um, so these are all ways in which ship symbolism is expressed. And boat barrels are just another more complex way to express this symbolism. Jan Bill uh, has argued that the ship symbol was already connected with death before the sixth century. We can see this in the Gotland picture stone that represent, according to Andren, a uh, man standing on, sitting on the, at the stern of the ship. And often in both burial, we find uh, the deceased in that position in the stern. And also uh, animals that are represented around the boat are animal that we animals that we find in boat burials. And also stone settings arranged in the boat shape. Sometimes we find, uh, we can find cremated remains under um, the stone setting. So it shows that there was a connection um, between death and the ship symbol. It is important to note that these ways of expressing the symbolism are not uniform, they're extremely valuable. Uh, they ended in some areas and continued in others, and they might be completely absent in some areas. So it's, uh, yeah, it's very variable. There is no uniformity, and um, but at least it shows that um, that, for example, on Gotland, no ship or boat burials have been found, and this shows that the important thing was to have the symbol of the boat and not the boat itself, the object. And this is also shown by the cremation graves where the where the boat is burned. So we can say that the boat symbol was conveyed in different forms of which the boat burials of the Viking Age are the most complex variation. And then it is uh, generally accepted that uh, the custom ended following the conversion to Christianity. So I wanna thank you for uh, been here and uh, please let me know if you have any question comments feedback anything thank you